On this episode of This Week in Linux, we take a look at some app releases from Emacs, OBS Studio, MarkText, Flatpak, and more. We'll also check out some distro releases from MX Linux, NixOX, and Proxmox. In the core news section of the show, we'll discuss some updates to Grub, Coreboot, and Wine. And later in the show, we'll take a look at an update from the KDE Plasma mobile team, as well as a new Humble Bundle with educational games for kids. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tanel with Tux Digital, and this is your weekly source for Linux GNU's. Up first in the show this week is a very popular text editor has a new release, which is Emacs 26.2. Now, we've never talked about Emacs on the show before, but it's a very popular text editor, and it's been around for a very long time. Uh, this particular release is not like a big release. It's more of a uh, improvements, uh, performance improvements, uh, maintenance, uh, bug fixes, that kind of thing. But I also wanted to talk about it because, well, it's Emacs, and we never talked about it before. So let's do that. So up first in this version, if you are if you are aware of Emacs, uh, there's the ability to build modules outside of the source tree was added. They also have compliance for Unicode 11, which is fairly new as well. Uh, and they also uh, have now the long-awaited ability to compress an entire directory full of files with a single keystroke. That's pretty cool. Um, now, as far as Emacs go, it's a text editor. Now, it does have a barrier to entry when you first use it. you got to set up configs and uh, install some plugins for certain features. And um, there is a little bit of a, you know, it's not for everybody type of, 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 of editor. It's for people who are like programmers or want to have a very custom structured editor, like specific to their workflow. It's really great for that kind of thing. But also, it's because it has a ton of actually multiple tons of, pro of plugins and add-ons. Uh, so there's actually some curated repos that are available, as well as some other uh, scattered different plugins in, that are you know out on the internet. But uh, with the curated repos, there's over 4,000 add-ons packages that are available for Emacs, including the ability to make Emacs into an email client. You can view and comment on PDFs. You can use Emacs as a note-taking application, like through org mode. You can use it uh, as a scheduler or a calendar, and it even has the ability to run commands at, because you can uh, turn it into shell. I, I basically have a text shell built into Emacs, so you can run commands alongside some, like something like Lisp, where you can integrate things and mix and match and do all kinds of stuff with inside of Emacs. So in a way, you could kind of sort of turn Emacs into its own operating system, um, because of how many plugins it is, and like not exactly, but you know, kind it's it's very extensive plugin options, is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, so if you haven't used it, if you haven't heard of it, and you're interested in some kind of editor that's, uh, while not necessarily user friendly by default, it does have a lot of powerful features, and it can be very useful to you if you wanted to go through the process of setting all that stuff up. So if you are interested, I have a link to the latest blog post or latest release notes for Emacs 26.2 in the show notes. Up next in the show is the latest release of 23.1 of OBS Studio. OBS Studio is the open broadcasting software studio, and it is a piece of software that allows you to do screen capture, a desktop recording, live streaming, uh, even like on-the-fly audio processing and all kinds of stuff. OBS is awesome, essentially. It's a, a very important application that allows uh, you to do all kinds of different things, so stream games to Twitch or make a podcast called This Week in Linux. I mean, there's that as well. And it's very powerful and very, and very useful. And this latest version of 23.1 adds some cool new features. So, for example, they add the ability to show a Twitch activity feed uh, panel that you can connect to OBS so you can see stuff happening in Twitch without having to have the Twitch website open and the dashboard from the website running. You can use OBS to directly look at the activity feed, which is very, very cool. You can also have integration with different accounts. Now, unfortunately, uh, these are not available on Linux yet, but they are working on making it available. Just right now, it's not. So, for example, Restream.io is available only on Windows. But it's really cool that they are doing that because eventually it will be very useful to have that built into the OBS system because it makes it a lot easier to set up these configurations. 
Uh, but the stuff that has been done for Linux is they've added the option to select color range for Linux video device sources, add the ability to copy and paste filters from the mixer, which is really, really nice. That makes it a lot easier and convenient. Uh, we also um, added the a preview and program labels to the studio mode. That doesn't sound like a big important thing, but it is. So, for example, if you ever open OBS, ever try to use OBS, by default it just shows one window of content. That is the program window, which means program meaning the what is being recorded kind of thing. However, there's a studio mode button underneath the stop or start and stop recording option. And that is a, gives you the ability to see two windows. Now, the left side window is actually a preview mode, whereas the right side is a recording. So, for example, right now, I have um, the left side preview section, something that allows me to easily switch back and forth to a new scene to show, like, on the fly switching. Rather, for example, so if I wanted to show the episode number, I would just hit the activation, and it would switch from the OBS particular thing to the the episode number and the date of the of the of the episode. So I can switch back easily, back and forth through a preview mode and a program mode. Now, when you first get you before twenty three point one, it wasn't really possible to tell by default if you're not used to using OBS, which one is what because they didn't really have any labels or anything or any identifiers of what they were. So some people would confuse what they're what they're for or how they work and that now while so basically this is a long explanation of this is not a huge deal but it adds a certain level of polish that makes it a lot easier to use an application that is this robust and powerful. And these kinds of things are very important for applications like this because even though it can do a ton of things. It also needs to be very clear about what it's doing. And adding these different types of imp improvements like these labels makes it a lot better overall. So moving on, they also made it possible to do bandwidth test mode in the settings for the Twitch account create in integration, for example. And they've also added the ability or added the uh, scale filtering area for sources as an alternative to point scaling, which can preserve uh, detail in like retro games and that kind of thing. So all these kinds of things that are happening, and even though this is a point release, is a 23.1, it's still a lot of really cool improvements that are polished to the particular, you know, to the application. So it's really nice to see, even though it's a small release, it's still a very useful release. And overall, OBS is just so awesome and so important that I just like to talk about it because it's a really good application and, uh, if you ever need to do screen capture or on-the-fly video production, it's a good option. Actually, the de facto standard, really, at this point. But anyway, before I go on to a, a, even more tangents about this application, let's just move on to the next topic. And uh, yeah, so the the, the OBS Studio 23.1 show uh, release notes will be in the show notes below. Up next in the show is Grub 2.04 Release Candidate. So if you haven't heard of it before, Grub is the bootloader for, essentially, for all of Linux. Now, it's not the only bootloader, but it is the definitely the most popular bootloader. And it is an open, a really widely used open source bootloader that has uh, basically the de facto standard at this point. Now, there are other things like System D boot and other, and other options, but Grub is pretty much the most popular and has been around for a very long time. Now, this next release is... 2.0.4. It's not out yet. It's currently in the release candidate stage, so it's it's going to be released pretty soon. We don't know exactly when. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk about it is because the last version of Grub release was 2.02, .02, and that was released like almost two years ago. So I just kind of want to talk about it because it's you know it's been a while. Uh, but this particular release adds a lot of interesting support and features. So it adds the ability to support multiple early init RD images. Support for the F2FS file system, a, veri a verifier framework. It adds the uh, UEFI secure boot shim support, ButterFS ZSTD improvements, and it also adds RISC V support. So, if you've not heard of it, RISC V is a, a chip architecture that is an open source chip architecture, 
and adding support for Grub means it a lot easier to use these in certain types of like uh, system on a chips and other, um, you know, making it easier for manufacturers to utilize Risk Five in their system by using Grub and Linux, for example. So this is very cool, and I look forward to the uh, full release because this is something that's been, a, um, you know, been in the works for a very long time so i'm happy to see that they're adding these kinds of things to improve the overall experience of using linux on whatever hardware you want to use it on so uh, grub 2.04 uh, release candidate show uh, release notes well soon to be release notes i guess will be in the show notes up next in the show is flat pack 1.3.2 now this is actually a version number that implies it's not that big of a uh, difference or a di big of an update, uh, but it is it is kind of a big difference because the update has a big change that's being made in this particular version. So previously, uh, Flatpak was the way it handled system wide installations was do um, was done with a pr uh, process involving temporary user owned directories and copying from there. But that method involved some extra I/O usage and also temporarily used more disk space to implement. So starting with Flatpak 1.3.2, they're now using a custom Fuse file system, and they use this to write uh, files to and then uh, copy files directly. Or the, well, the files can be directly imported into the system repository without any extra copy operations. Um, but this is kind of interesting because it allows you to uh, allows flat packs to use less resources and less storage in order to accomplish kind of the same thing but because that's so that's really good uh, but this does change some of the aspects of flat packs it does add an extra dependency uh, it has an and it adds the dependency of fuse which is the file system in user space not an acronym but that's what it is and um, that also means that are going to require a flat pack user on the system so we'll have to change the way they install flat packs so you'll have to probably in order to implement this you'll have to update your entire uh, flat pack uh, runtime structure uh, which is not going to be that much of an effort it was just basically you know just update flat pack so it's not really going to be that hard or anything it's just the, these changes are going to uh, potentially change the way flat packs are built but for the better in many ways so this is going to make it uh, theoretically should make it where the flat packs are much smaller take up less space and also install faster so this is very cool uh, Flatpak 1.3.2 has been released and hopefully we will see them uh, rolling it out to everyone really quickly as well as uh, Flatpak's developers or you know developers of Flatpak apps implementing uh, these these changes quickly so anyway if you'd like to find out more about Flatpaks and Flatpak 1.3.2 I have a link in the show notes up next in the show is wine and wine staging of 4.6 releases. So wine staging is a more experimental branch of wine. Uh, they're very, they're pretty much, they, they do the same thing, but uh, wine staging tests things out before it goes into wine. So that's what that is if you're not, if you're not aware of the difference. But first of all, let's talk about wine 4.6. Uh, this actually adds the initial, uh, the initial work to get Vulcan wine D3D back in running in, uh, inside of wine. The Wine D3D is the name of that particular backend. Uh, so this makes it possible for you know getting you know going through the process of getting to that point of being able to use Vulkan uh, Wine Direct 3D uh, implementation. So that's pretty cool. They've also support for loading mono libraries from a shared location, as well as no longer uh, needing lib uh, libwine.dll when using Wine DLLs on Windows. It also has improvements to uh, support for the split button common control as well as video capture has been ported to video for Linux version 2 which is just going to be a lot more efficient and uh, more reliability and compatible uh, version for video for Linux which is very nice to see they've also done some stuff for wine staging that's why they're both in here and wine staging update is um, better for performance for multi-threaded games and also applications due to a a reworked implementation of Wine of the Windows synchronization primitives. Uh, better for performance, basically, is for this is um, it's interesting because it's it's coming from like a five year old bug report around the synchronization primitives implemented by Wine, and these primitives have been optimized by re-implementing them on top of Linux event FD primitives. This uh, this should be like a 
a very important thing because having multi-threaded Windows programs, including games, will uh, be better, more efficient and more reliable and also work better as far as compatibility goes by having this change being added. So that's very cool. Although it is not by default right now in wine staging, so if you do want to try it out, you have to uh, manually activate it. But uh, it's still pretty cool that they're working on this because it means that future versions of Wine and theoretically future versions of Proton and Steamplay would be uh, beneficial to have this just change. So that's very cool. If you'd like to learn more about Wine uh, and Wine staging, I'll have a link to the release notes in the show notes below. Up next in the show is something I'm really excited about, and that's Plasma Mobile working on a PinePhone dev kit. So Plasma Mobile has been in development for a couple years now, and they are turning the Plasma interface, the KDE Plasma interface, into a mobile interface and having it optimized for phones, which is awesome, and I can't wait to try this. I'm actually, I can't wait to get the Bind phone itself because it's such an interesting device that I, uh, you know, I hope it comes soon, and I I think it's going to be like the end of the year, maybe early next year, but I can't wait. I want it to come out now. So as soon as possible, please. Anyway, let's continue with the actual topic. So the KDE team posted on Reddit a a photo of the Plasma Mobile running on the PinePhone dev kit, which is really cool because the PinePhone essentially announced, Pine64, Pine announced that they were going to um, make the PinePhone, and then within like a couple weeks, they issued out dev kits. So it's, they're working really quickly to get to the like an actual stage of being available, and it's already working on uh, on the dev kit with Post Market OS, and they've also confirmed that the phone uh, SIM as, uh, aspect, like telephony, is working uh, properly at least in the dev kit model. So that's very cool and very interesting progress. So I'm happy to see that. So uh, I'll have that. All they basically did was show this this photo. I'll have a link to the photo so you can get a bigger view if you want in the uh, show notes below, um, as well as the Reddit post itself, because there was an interesting conversation inside the comments th- section there. So if you are if you are interested in ch- seeing that stuff, I'll have a link to that as well as the link to the episode where we talked about the Pine Phone previously when they announced it. So if you want to learn more about that, I'll have a link to that as well in the show notes. So yeah, I'm looking forward to this very much. Up next in the show is a new Humble Bundle. Normally when we talk about Humble Bundles on the show, I, I refer to games that are for Linux or educational bundles for books like programming and that kind of thing. But in this case, it's a combination of the two, and it's educational games for kids on Linux. And this is interesting because if you pay like $14, I think that's the top tier price, you get 33 educational games for kids, including uh, Big Thinkers, Kindergarten, and First Grade, uh, Putt Putt and Pep's Balloonorama, Spy Fox, Freddy Fish, and Pajama Sam. I mean, I assume it's pajama because of the pajama Sam, not pajama because that wouldn't rhyme very well. Whatever. Uh, anyway... So if you are interested in checking it out, maybe if you have kids or you know someone who has kids, these games might be helpful to uh, help them get excited about learning, uh, you know, just learning in general, a uh, variety of different topics. Like there's all kinds of different topics that are in- included in these games. So maybe this would be helpful if you do have kids um, because, you know, it's only $14. And if they are helpful in any way, probably worth it. So I'll have a link to the Humble Bundle educational kit for uh, I think it's called the humongous entertainment bundle okay and uh, this bundle link in this sh- in the show notes and the description uh, is an affiliate link just so you know this is uh, this is if you purchase the uh, bundle through this link it will give a small commission to the Tux digital channel and this podcast which I would appreciate it if you were to decide to purchase this if you were to use that link because uh, it does help the channel and help the podcast grow uh, so if you do decide to do it or do decide to purchase it, please use that link below uh, to benefit the channel. Anyway, so yeah, Hum Bundle, Humongous Entertainment Bundle, the educational games for kids. Up next in the show is the latest release of MX Linux 18.2. And this release adds a lot of interesting features. It's mostly a maintenance update, but they did add some really cool things. So we're going to talk about that and uh, they including some 
um, accessibility options for you know when you when you are having high contrast themes for low visibility impairments, having large uh, size themes, so as well as on-screen keyboard for people who have mobility issues. Uh, so that's really cool. I mean, they they are still working on having screen reader support, uh, but that's not available yet. But it's great to see that they are putting in the effort to do. Uh, accessibility uh, improvements to their distro because that's very important. And the the worst thing about not having that is that people who don't have those uh, those issues don't even think about it until you know a, a podcast talks about it or because our user requests some kind of support for it or something like that. It's not even like we I've had it many times where I've uh, been asked while I was contributing to a distro what uh, like what do you have for your accessibility and it's like uh. I didn't even think about it. Sorry. So that's that, that's great that they're doing it because it, is, it shows that they are, you know, listening to people and help and providing extra benefits to people who do need those kinds of things. Anyway, they've also done a lot of other cool stuff. For example, they've updated their manual, which is good because a lot of distros kind of forget that. Even the big distros sometimes forget to update their manual and have out-of-date information that's not relevant anymore. I'm not going to name any names, but you know who you are. Anyway, so it's good that they have that. The AMX manual has been updated. That's great. They've also uh, updated some uh, stuff for repository mirrors for the, the MX repo manager. They've done some improvements to the MX installer, and they've upgraded the entire like base to Debian 9.8 stretch. So... Very cool. And another thing I want to talk about that's really, really great is the Antics Live USB system that they have included into MX Linux, which also provides persistent supports. So the Antics, if you're not aware, Antics Linux is something we've talked about in a previous episode as well. And Antics Linux is another distribution, but they have a very deep collaboration connection between MX Linux and Antics. So Antics, um, MX Linux is kind of like uh, Mepis and Antics combined together to make another distro, sort of. Not exactly, but that's kind of where the names come from. But Antics Linux is a very lightweight Debian-based distribution that is more for like ultra-light hardware usage, uh, streamlining as much as possible, and not really for everyday users. But MX Linux is kind of taking that uh, same kind of approach, but putting it more in a, pol a polished distribution with a more user-friendly approach. So it's a really interesting um, dichotomy between the two because they are uh, working together at the same time, providing very different approaches as well. But anyway, one of the things that, that, that Antics does is they have the live, live USB system with persistence. And if you're not aware, persistence allows you to install a system onto a USB flash drive or thumb drive and able to save your settings or configurations or files or whatever to that drive or another drive if you want to do it that way. Now, without persistence, which most distros don't provide persistence by default, um, when you reboot your system, all the changes you make or whatever are basically thrown away. So by default, most distributions do it where everything is saved into RAM. So you can install applications, but it's installing to the live environment only. And as soon as you reboot, it's gone. Whereas the persistence aspect of the Antics Live USB adds the ability to continue to use the system without installing, but also saving the configurations and changes that you make. So it's a good way to kind of test out a distro on a more longer term basis than just a single boot. So anyway, that's really cool that they added that, and it, it has a potential to make it more accessible to people to try out MX Linux rather than you know having to distro hop all the time, or maybe they don't want to test out or change their existing system, but they want to try it out for a longer period. The persistence aspect allows them to do that. So very, very cool. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about MX Linux or Antix Linux, I have a link to the MX Linux blog post for 18.2 in the show notes, as well as a link to Antix Linux when we talked about it on a previous episode. So I'll have a link to those in the show notes. Up next in the show, and also continuing on with the distro news, is Proxmox 5.4 VE, or Virtual Environment Edition. And this Proxmox is based on Debian 9.8. Well, version 5.4 is based on 9.8. And uh, if you haven't heard of it, Proxmox is a... Um, it's an app. It's a distribution that allows you to manage and deploy 
uh, wide, uh, high availability virtual environments. And also is like very flexible in how you uh, manage those, those environments. Uh, this latest release, they, the way they describe this release is they, the new features of Proxmox VE 5.4 focus on usability and simple management of the software-defined infrastructure as well as on security management. You know, that's kind of buzz buzzwordy, but the reason why they're talking about it is the way that they have implemented Ceph in this newest version because they made it a lot easier with a user interface to install the with, the, the, with a new wizard. So previously, they've actually had support for Ceph for a while, since 2014. Uh, and Ceph is a distributed storage technology that makes it a lot easier to uh, do some of this, uh, the storage for the different virtual environments. Uh, but previously, it was more complicated to set it up. Now, you just go through a wizard to set it all up, and it's a lot, a lot more seamless structure to, you know, a user experience, I mean. This is also interesting because they've, int they've in introduced this uh, this uh, wizard through like a web interface so it has made it the installation uh, instead of Ceph going through the command line it makes it ex like much much faster and easier to do as well as configure like hyper converged clusters with Ceph. Um, another thing that's interesting is that they've improved their installations st setup because like they used to have this weird where you couldn't um, it, like the installation process of setting up Proxmox was a little uh, odd in the sense that it wouldn't allow you to go back and change things while you're going through the wizard. Uh, now that you can do that, making it a lot easier to um, set up the system and set up the overall environments. So very cool structure. And if you haven't heard of Proxmox and you're interested in doing some virtual environments, it is an easier uh, option. And it is open source and it's an easier option to do rather than doing like a, you know, uh, libvirt-d or qemu that you have to do those things manuals. Those are also great. Like lib, uh, vert manager is great but you have to get used to that kind of environment uh, and you have to get used to building those um, those deployments. Um, so uh, this is more of a gradual setup, not really gradual, but more of a, um, a user-friendly approach to doing this kind of management of virtual environments. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about Proxmox and this particular release, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Up next in the show is NixOS 19.03. We actually talked about NixOS in a previous episode. I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well if you'd like to check it out. But NixOS is an independent Linux distribution that uses a, the and uses the Nix package manager. So NixOS can install uh, snapshots of packages and manage software and services through a central configuration file. So it's a very different approach to the overall Linux desktop, and it's very interesting the way they do it. Uh, but it is definitely m more so on the experienced user side. It's not really meant for everyone. Uh, it's they're not. It's not really user friendly in that way. But at the same time, it is really interesting because the way they do the atomic updates uh, and the way they do rollbacks is really really interesting. So if you are interested in that kind of thing, then I would suggest checking out NixOS. Uh, but this latest version has improvements to K Kubernetes. Uh, it offers a UEFI enabled image for the. Uh, uh, ARC uh, 64 powered computers or ARC 64 powered computers. Uh, it also has a, ma a major refactoring of their Kubernetes modules. So the, the, the refactoring primarily focuses on decoupling components and enhancing security. So that's always nice to see. And they've also done some other stuff um, like upgrading the or uh, changing the confinement options for system D services and many other things. So if you are interested in NixOS, uh, I'll have a link to it in the show notes because it is a pretty interesting dis distribution, though, again, fair warning, it's not for everybody. So anyway, NixOS 19.03, link in the show notes. Up next in the show is MarkText. It's a text editor for Markdown, and this latest release is 0.14.0. Now, you may be thinking, don't we already have enough Markdown editors? And that's a fair point because there are quite a few of those and pretty much every text editor has support for Markdown in some way. However, this is an interesting approach because they're trying to make a simple and elegant Markdown editor that still has a lot of power and has a nice user experience. So if you wanted to use Markdown for some kind of editing, uh, some kind of like writing option, uh, whether you wanted to build websites with Markdown, which some uh, site generators have that ability to do so, uh, it's an interesting approach because they have the ability to create uh, really powerful documents with different types of specs while at the same time still focusing on a good user experience. So that's why I wanted to talk about this. Uh, so first of all, 
this has, uh, as you would expect, markdown editing, but it also has a real-time preview, like a WYSIWYG uh, viewer. It has support for common mark specifications as well as GitHub flavored markdown. They have a bunch of uh, markdown extensions such as math expressions like Katek, uh, front matter, and emojis, which is important. <laughs> they also have support for outputting your files to, from markdown to HTML and PDF files, as well as having uh, the ability to use some inline style shortcuts to um, basically improve writing efficiency and they have these link uh, linking abilities so you have uh, inside of your uh, markdown file you can link to other markdown files and you can open files in new windows or new tabs uh, to be able to uh, m manage multiple different having a bigger project of multiple markdown files what is really interesting is they also have support for diagrams a lot of them actually and this latest release adds even more so this this release has support for flowcharts, uh, Vega diagrams, mermaid and sequence diagrams, and also they already had support for Gantt diagrams. So there's a pretty powerful thing for a markdown editor to have. So that is very cool. And also they have a lot of different various themes that you can use, uh, like a, a dark theme, uh, um, a bright theme, a multicolored theme, like a nice like material design theme, all kinds of stuff. And and they also have um, a editing mode approach where you have source code editing, typewriter mode editing, and like a focus mode to get like all distractions out of the way. So it's interesting the way they have the editor built where it has all these different features but at the same time it has a heavy focus on like the elegant user experience aspects to it. So anyway, I just wanted to bring this to your attention because I do think it has it's worth checking out if you uh, do any kind of editing in Markdown. So yeah, mark, mark text 0.14.0, link in the show notes. Up next in the show is some Coreboot news. Not necessarily specifically from Coreboot, but from other companies that are using Coreboot. So first of all, uh, Purism has some interesting information about they now have pre-built binaries for their uh, usage of Coreboot BIOS firmware, as well as some binaries for their tamper-evident Pureboot firmware. Uh, I have a link to more like details about why that's important in the show notes. Uh, but another thing that they did is adding support for um, tamper evident support for non TPM versions of their laptops, the Librem 13 and Librem 15. Uh, and in addition to the to Purism, uh, Intel has been working on some interesting thing for Core Boot. Uh, first of all, the thing they're one of the things that they're working on is multi CPU support within Core Boot for multi socket server platforms. And also, they are working on a SMM replacement or a system management mode replacement called PRM or protected runtime mechanism. And uh, this is is interesting because uh, traditionally uh, the CPU, the CP, the system management mode is where the system firmware operates for its purposes around power management and um, other hardware control behavior. PRM or protected runtime mechanism is designed, they, Intel says, to offer better performance, lower latency, and other improvements over the traditional SMM mode. So this has a lot of potential to improve uh, the core boots uh, de uh, deployment as well as adoption and overall just interesting usage for it. So if you'd like to learn more about core boot or any of this kind of stuff, I have a link to it in the show notes. Up next in the show and the last topic for this week is some unfortunate news with a little bit of a silver lining and that is Matrix.org had a security breach. So if you're not aware, Matrix.org is kind of like a open source protocol for making your own self-hosted Slack, or also you can federate your, uh, your setup of Matrix with other Matrix servers and you know basically have your own private server as well as connect to a federated system to have conversations with people in all kinds of different places and all kinds of different servers, including the matrix.org main server. So the silver lining is that this does not affect, affect the actual protocol of matrix. It is specifically to matrix.org server. So some details about this particular, um, this breach is that the intruder got access to the production databases, which potentially gives them access to unencrypted message data, uh, password hashes and access tokens. So, they say as a precaution, you need to go ahead and change your password for your matrix.org user account. 
Uh, if you don't have a matrix.org user account and you're using your own self-hosted version, you're not affected at all because it's not related to the protocol. It's just the matrix.org users. However, also if you're using matrix.org to integrate with like Freenode and your IRC servers, you should change your password uh, to those accounts as well, just as a precaution. Uh, the, the attacker made use of a known vulnerability in Jenkins to the access server, so it kind of might be the fact that Matrix Order didn't just they didn't update the Jenkins, um, the Jenkins installation, because it ha it has been patched re uh, in recent versions. I'm not really sure how how recent it was patched, but uh, it does seem like that's what happened. So they were able to capture SSH keys for the production infrastructure. Uh, using including the Cloudflare Cloudflare usage for Matrix, and giving them access to uh, SSH and port forwarding, or not port forward, agent forwarding. Um, so it's interesting because th this is um, this is a, it's a it's a fairly big issue that they um, announced really quickly, and they uh, they're very being very transparent about it. So that's awesome that they're very transparent about this, so people can go in there and change their password as soon as possible. And I have to like worry about you know not being told in time and that kind of thing. So that's great um, in that sense. It's not great in the sense they got a you know security breach, but it's good that they uh, handled it in a professional and open manner and transparent manner. So that part is good, and also the fact that it's not necessarily the protocol that's been affected, just that particular server. However, it is the most popular server used, so. Again, that part is not really that good. So I'm not saying it's a good news or any way whatsoever. It's just there is a little bit of a silver lining in this negative news. But, yeah. Anyway, I do like Matrix. I think it's a great uh, protocol. And I think it is a, a really good way to set up your own Slack system. And also, if you have, if you want to create your own self hosted Slack for a company, it's very cool in that sense, too, because it allows you to do that. So overall, I think Matrix is really cool. And the Riot... Uh, Riot.im client is really nice to use, really uh, easy to use and set up. Uh, overall, I do like Matrix, but I thought it'd be good if you are a Matrix user because I have talked about Matrix in the past and Riot in the past that I should talk about in this because this is a an issue that might affect the people who are watching the show. So if you are affected, you should definitely change your password immediately, um, and of course, don't use the same password on Matrix or any other website at all ever. Make sure every website has a different password because that is better. That's good password management. Get a password manager specifically for that if you, because, well, otherwise it's be impossible to maintain all that stuff. So if you're interested in that, check out Bitwarden. I've talked about Bitwarden in the past on this show as well. So, yeah. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about this particular security breach, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Ch Tux Digital channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux Everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Linux Everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe. I really need to make it a smaller URL, like maybe slash store or something. But in the meantime, we also have ways to contribute without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, and many others by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. If you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux, as I'm a co-host of that show. And just a reminder, this show is live usually every Saturday, except for the past couple of episodes. But still, that will be changed this coming week, so it will be live this week. So be sure to join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news. And thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tanel with Tux Digital. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.